Okay. All right. So now I guess they can hear me. Okay. Do you sound the way? Yeah. Give me your phone. What? So that it doesn't try to play no more on the server. Is it not seven? Silent. So what you mean by silent? Uh, oh, yeah. Hmm? Yeah. I might take a picture of you with the phone as well. You want a glass of water or something? Um, I'm going to go. Does Brian do the thing that Erickson has with you know, people using? Huh? You might take the committee aside. needs to know that um, we're only proposing that we're contingent on having a proper protocol. Okay. Hello. It's also Bagel. Hello. Hello. Hey. Together. Mm -hmm. Might be a theory farewell. What's that? There might be a theory farewell at the end of this. So um, I'm thinking more quivering lips. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with dudes, as you know, the, the tearing up happens, but it usually takes more for tearing. The, the quivering, the tension in the muscles under the lower lip is more like. It's a good order. Like, so if you rank things in terms of healthiness, the more you add to the healthy end, the less healthy things you will order. So you take like things that help you by looking at it? Mm. What's wrong with that theory? I think so. Alex is basically down. Jim is envisioning being down shortly. Charlie's being envisioning being down shortly. <coughs> Stephen is, is envisioning being down shortly. Stephen's down there. I actually see where they see it because they will be on that list. Erica is envisioning being down shortly. That's, that's so I think there are, there are six people who would like to be gone in May. 
and I think that probably all six of them will be on in there. Probably something very close to. Congratulations, Stephen. Thanks. Yeah. Exciting. My goal is completely ignoring you as you pass me on the street. I know. <laughs> Even though I was like, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. Is there anything you need from me? Nope. Mm. I'm going to go, go get my special signing pen. Do you have your phone? I do. Yep. I'm going to go get my signing pen. Matt, I'm sorry. I saw your email. Oh. Is there a good time? Um, I think any time post, like, 2 to 2.30 should be good. Okay. So. Do you want to get coffee or something? Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. I will stop by your office. Perfect. Oh. Can you check to see if it's not? I know. You should have a bad one, too. I just don't think it's sick. Sick. Sick for allergies. No, sick. Yeah. Mono's going around. What? Three of my friends in mono right now. Really? In the barn? I'm not in the barn. What? Are you all making out with each other? I don't know. This is muted. But if we turn this on, presumably we'll hear. Is this the Hangout connection? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe you can look for comments in the group. <laughs> Somehow I feel like there's something. Thanks. That would be at least two. <laughs> coffee and a donut. Nothing beats coffee and donuts. In the morning. They're the two things I can taste right now. <laughs> Sugar and bitterness. I've tempted to get and tell and put it on a donut. Oh, crap, a donut. That would be awesome. There you go. With a really chocolate donut. And there one. There's one left. Yeah. Oh, I got it. How's it going? I got very good data again. How's it going, Ben? What's that? Um, it's okay. We're in the other cell line. Just getting a lot of business cards. Oh, yeah. Yo. And I'm trying to follow up with them. Of course, I'll be responsible. Oh, yeah. What's the point? I am dropping the CC notes without mm -hmm. Yeah. But a lot of them are restricted. It's not the easiest room to find. Are you getting more sleep? The only one I applied for was IMS. Oh, you can apply. Did you talk to them? Yeah, I talked to them. They're really interesting. Yeah, yeah. They're more interested. Have you checked your academic info? Oh, I'm so that, profile, that, that might be restricting what's restricting you. No, but they restrict PhDs. I miss, I miss is asking for PhDs, it does. Oh, I don't know about that. that. Like, job. I, I didn't know they were on CCNF. Yeah, what? It was an epic battle. Awesome. Oh, okay. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Long <laughs> time no Steve. I know. Practicing that in the leadership skills like that. Oh, we almost <laughs> forgot about that assignment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's Boy, right, yeah. Yeah, it's probably about the same. Yeah. That could have been bad. Mm -hmm. I just, like, wrote a whole Classes, you know. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna get my cholesterol tested today for July. July? Yeah. yeah. Excited. It was last night. Oh, I don't have a lot of eggs. Oh, too. All right, well, there you go. <laughs> so, so we'll see. <laughs> what's Actually, new and exciting? I, I did it on purpose. What's new and exciting? Just to see. So much know. work. Mm -hmm. God. What? I kind of did it on I'm teaching freshman chemistry and it's just killing me. 920 kids. Should have been like a charge. Getting his no, feet to make it go all the way. The new person I know to my favorite. Okay. <laughs> All you have to do is beat your head. It's just one card to teach, but it's just a good one. Yeah, it's his cholesterol level. I know that's how I park it. Oh. <coughs> the time required. You're competitive. You're stupid. It's independent of it. I've got high cholesterol. But the time spent doing it. I'm having the lowest. There you go. Depends. Because oh. here, if it gets big enough, then they assume that you're completely incapable of doing it. And then they have a 
<laughs> so there's a turnover point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Probably in the 60 to 80 students in that ballpark. And 900 clearly above. So this is a whole infrastructure to take care of all that. Okay. Yeah. So for example, I don't sign any ad drops of any sort because it would have to be one. So there's like 26 TAs. Uh, person who takes care of all of the TAs, four staff. I mean, this is a big, big operation. How many courses are like that? In chemistry, you know, well, organic is a little bit, you know, because it has half as many students, but not quite the same level of, of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. In terms of administration. I'm a great spot that I love. That vest is awesome. Good. How come we don't have that? I use this. This is an award that I got a number of years ago, so I use the monitors to buy things like this for the whole group. Buy. Uh, merch. And it's real It's real data. I mean, that's a real world time program that was him. <laughs> so, full disclosure, you guys are in the view of the webcam. Where is the webcam? Which is broadcasting. And, uh, and we're broadcasting to your parents? I think my mother and maybe my brother. <laughs> and, and is she watching? Is she watching? Is she watching? Is she watching? Is this, is this, so this is not on my channel. This is on. This is uh, <laughs> the Google Plus Hangout that's live. I see. And so it is streaming on YouTube. I see. <laughs> say hi, Mrs. Webby. I want to say hi to Alex's mom. Yeah. Find out how her GTI is doing in the GTI. She uh, she got rid of the GTI. She got rid of the GTI. I thought the agreement was that she could sell that to uh, She decided to uh, finish the agreement. Wow, well, that is acceptable. So do we, is there a way for us to see the feed? Mm -hmm. You can also hear yourself. But it's a mirror image. Is that? Uh, I think we need to rotate the camera. Am I? I hope I'm not being annoying. Mm -hmm. But then it's upside down. That was supposed to go like. Yeah. <laughs> So that's perfect. There's probably something where you can. Uh, this way. Well, I think you need to. Um, so there's some setting. Yeah, it's not. I think it shows you the mirror image, but it shows them the actual image. No, but this. It's supposed to hang on your screen, right? So that's why. It's fine for everything but text, right? Yeah. You're not showing it that today, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if they can even read the text anymore. Yeah, I don't think it's a problem. <laughs> you probably know this, but coat time is usually about 10 minutes after. Yeah. Pretty every I'm going to play with the effects, right? So I'm going to have a funny hat on. <laughs> Whoa, what's that for? That's the Gigi Network. The uh, Electro, like? whatever. I don't know, but there was a study here at Cornell. Oh, oh okay. That said that, yeah, so, they, so are you looking at images or something? Did you double protect me? Yeah, so the, the way it works, yeah, so they, they you know, like kind of read your thoughts if you're doing something. Okay. Not really read your thoughts. Maybe we said something. <laughs> like responding so that particular oh. experiment was you would look at faces. You would just have to stay really still and just look at faces. And you would have to remember, it was like a memory test, supposedly. So if you had seen the face two faces ago, and you press one, otherwise you press zero. OK. So they just phase, phase, phase. Um, and that's what they tell you, so you do that. And then you do that like a bunch of times. And after that, what they're actually looking at is seeing how you respond to different kinds of things. In particular, they have you know random people, and then they have uh, same people, which you know, really cause something in your brain because you recognize it. 
And the idea is that they're looking to see if, if how fast your response is. Yeah. With famous versus non-famous people, is how your EEG changes these things. Yeah, but the fact that it was a show. Came up to me. I think it was. Uh, <laughs> it's like really far. Wow. It's, uh, it in, was it in? Um, it's a building that. An MBR. Were you an MBR? I don't know. What's that? It's the one that's right next to Evil Lake. Yeah. That may be it. Yeah. So it has all these like. Uh, Dresses on the first that's floor. Yes, that's in the air. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah, a machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's something along those lines. Yeah. There they do all sorts of things that are related to humans. Fiber science, which is kind of why the dresses are yeah, down there, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, uh, they just made it. One of their professors that's going to be on my committee, he just made it into. Well, he was going to be. I am not having him. But, yeah. So what is he on by? How do you end up here? Um, you you remember that? The solar I don't race, you know. Uh, there's a lot of Yeah, sure. So I just, I just looked for fun. Yeah. 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 A couple weeks ago, I did this thing yeah. on the lake. Yeah. 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 No, I would totally get yeah, something. Yeah. Something like, like, yeah, like yeah, 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 if I went to visit my city. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Uh, but I feel like they were so nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
any meeting before this starts. I your call. I don't have any. Okay. So if everyone's ready to start, I think that, that will start. So Charlie, if you don't mind, the best is if you can leave it so that the little wood thing, door stop thing, is holding it open because I think that door is locked. So in case anyone comes, if it's propped open, they can join us. Ready to rock? Yep. Okay. Uh, so I'm delighted that everyone is here for Alex's, the open portion of Alex's B exam, which is entitled Transport and Microscale Electrokinetic Transport and Systems with Forest and Charge Interfaces and Microfluidic Device for Neuroculture. I will keep my introduction short. Uh, Alex has uh, been in our group uh, for some time and has really influenced the group in countless ways that go well beyond what he'll talk about today. Uh, I'll be happy to expound about that at the bar later. Uh, but for the moment, uh, I'm very excited to see the work that he'll be presenting. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, so I'm Alex Garbady, and this is my B exam presentation. And I'll be speaking about uh, two, po two topics. Uh, first, I'll talk about some of the earlier work I did uh, building a cell culture device with neurons. And then the bulk of the talk will be on my more recent work, uh, which concerns the electrokinetic analysis of porous and charged layers. And so you can see uh, sort of vignettes of both of these uh, topics here. All right, so I've uh, divided this talk into four sections, again, with emphasis towards the later work. So we'll start out with uh, looking at this micro device for neural culture with some cellular delivery, then move on to introduction and background for electrokinetics of soft and charged layers, um, and then finally get into the, to the actual work that I did with the porous and charged layers. So let's begin with the micro device for neural culture and cellular delivery. Um, so neurons are basically the central component of the nervous system. Um, so they're long cells. I have a soma, which is the cell body, and then a long axon is terminated at the growth cone or axon terminal once the cell is fully developed. Um, and so important things to note here is that oftentimes the volume contained within this axon is much larger than the cell, and also there's a lot of transport that goes along um, inside of this axon from the growth cone or terminal back up to the cell body or soma. So it's been hypothesized that defects in the axonal transport are, are driven by perturbations of uh, solutes around around the axon. And so again, um, you're moving things back and forth along this axon. When that transport stops, it's dangerous to the cell. So if we if we look in, maybe there's some uh, so, you know this is red lightning bolt. Something bad has happened. Um, and so we can zoom in on what's going on near the growth cone. So you have these microtubules where the transport occurs. Um, and then if we presume that the, the damage is there, uh, perhaps there's this vesicle that's getting carried by these motor proteins into some destabilization of the microtubule, and that, that causes a failure of transport and eventually cell death. And so in order to investigate this hypothesis, uh, we designed a micro device. Uh, and so there are many uh, aspects to this device. Uh, and so the idea is that we have we control the spatial and temporal distribution of solutes on the neurons. And so to do this, you need several things. Um, you need to actually grow the neurons on the slide here. So you have a neuron that's growing on this green thing, which is polylysine. Um, and then it, it grows into these glass channels, and I'll discuss what this line is later in the talk. But you can see that this is very small. So the reason that we choose these sizes uh, is based on the, the biology of the neuron itself. We also want some localized solute delivery to the neurons. And so we have a cross-channel configuration where there's solute flow, and then that's uh, 90 degrees or orthogonal to the direction of uh, neuron growth. And these are on uh, different planes. This is the solute flow typically take place above um, where the cell is. And then also, uh, instead of just looking at one of these cells, we'll have multiple multiple ways that we can look at the cell. So are those two channels connected, or yes, they are connected. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. At the, at the intersection. Um, and then this allows us to uh, do a, a parallel, or to parallelize the data collection, so you can get you know many more replicates with one device. And so again, there's a lot of different um, aspects to this work. Um, so we need to know something about cellular behavior. We need to do a lot of fabrication and there is fluid mechanics involved and some understanding of the transport. Um, and then when we combine all of these things, we get our device and then hopefully uh, some neurobiological results. And so the actual de design of the device, the device consists of PDMS and glass. Um, and the reason we choose PDMS and glass is because it's amenable to cell culture and microscopy. So here you can see neurons in a phase contrast image. This is taken from the device. So the, the scale bar here is, is 25 microns. And you're able to see. First, first of all, you can see the cells, and you can see the cells clearly. Um, second of all, you can see that they're growing, and they're not clumping, and they're not dying, um, which is essential if you want to do any type of work on this platform. Um, and then getting to the, to the previous question, um, we have several inlet ports. We have cells. The flow comes down, and the cells grow counter uh, to the flow. 
And so the way that we deliver this flow um, to the cells in these regions, if we, if we look at a, a small area, we have the flow going across and the cells going into and out of the board. And so they're only exposed at a, a very small uh, intersect, intersected region. Uh, and then there's one more thing that I'd like to point out is that we actually work with the channel. Uh, so right here, this is about 200 microns wide. No, but the area of the well, this is uh, so so it's, uh, affected. It's about like 50 by 2 microns. Yeah, so this is a very a very small channel. So the reason we choose this uh, this small is I'll, I'll get to here is uh, we do not want the cell body to enter the channel. We only want the axon to grow in. Um, and so we are able to, to visualize that we, we do, in fact, prevent the cell body from going in. Uh, where our collaborators performed a staining, or excuse me, a labeling of the mitochondria in the cell. And then we're able to see here that uh, the, the parts that get transported around do, in fact, grow into these, uh, grow into these long chains. Uh, and so this is what the final device looks like, and <coughs> along with the uh, citation will represent this work. OK, so now that I've discussed the micro device, uh, which is uh, work that is mostly pre-A exam, uh, I'll now get into the work, more recent work, starting with an introduction and background uh, for the electrokinetics of soft and charged layers. Um, so soft and charged or porous and charged layers are in a variety of, uh, variety of systems. What I mean by a porous and charged layer is some region that's permeable to flow, but also contains a, a fixed charge. So you can imagine here, these blue strands are polymers. They have some negative charge on the surface. And then there are positive charges that can move around because uh, it's in fluid. And so these occur in a variety of different systems. It could be something biological, like cartilage attachment study. Um, but the materials that we're looking at are something more that you find in like a fuel cell or filtration membrane, particularly looking at, uh, we'll look at Nation. And if you want to understand how uh, fluxes of, of current and flow uh, move around in the system in response to gradients and electrical potential or pressure, um, then you need to, to model or experiment on the system. So some more uh, background on these on electrokinetic behavior, that most solids will become charged when in contact with a liquid. There are three major charging mechanisms. Uh, the first is an ion activity difference. So you see this a lot in silver halides. The second is chemical ionization which is something that you'll see in, in glass. Uh, so you have a, basically an acid-base reaction here. And then finally, um, you can have this sort of ion entrapment mechanism where you have ions of, of different valence coming to bump each other off uh, off of some, some lattice. And that will give an apparent charge if the three replaces the two um, at this site here. And this surface charging is responsible for a variety of phenomena. So here I'm highlighting uh, streaming current or streaming potential where you have a flow that's pushing this cloud of ions that has a, a charge that's balanced by the bound charge in the wall. Um, and so there are, there are a variety of phenomena. I won't go to all of them. Um, but it's also known that these phenomena are related. And this was shown experimentally in 1892 by Saxane uh, when he looked at electrosmosis and streaming current. And there's a really a convenient way to describe all of this, and that's uh, through the electrokinetic coupling matrix. And so the electrokinetic coupling matrix allows you to connect the fluxes, so fluxes in, in flow and current, to forces which are gradients and pressure and electrical potential. And these various coefficients will tell you how the system behaves in all the phenomena that I uh, showed on the previous slide. And so one important thing to point out is that this is applicable for linear phenomena only. Um, and also, there's an equivalence between these coefficients, as I described experimentally. But also, it's known from Onsager that there is reciprocity between um, the off-diagonal terms, so chi 1, 2, and chi 2, 1. And so if we know these coefficients, we can describe all linear electrokinetic phenomena. Then you need to know these coefficients um, for each individual system, because they will be geometry dependent. All right, so, after, so now that we've discussed uh, the background, I'd like to talk about uh, my contributions to improving the descriptions of electrokinetic phenomena in soft and charged layers. So coming back to the electrokinetic coupling matrix, uh, we can express these coefficients generally in terms of integrals. And so this one right here, pi 1, 1, is a hydraulic conductivity term. And you can think of this term as relating to something like Darcy's law, where you apply a pressure, you generate a flow field, and then you want to know what is the integrated flow or average flow that occurs in that channel. Pi 1, 2 is the electroosmotic conductivity term. And so instead of a pressure-driven flow generating, a uh, pressure uh, gradient generating a flow, you have uh, a gradient in electric field generating a flow. 
And that flow profile will, will typically have um, this type of a shape because it depends um, more on the distribution of uh, free charge in the system. Chi 2-1 is a streaming current conductivity term. And so what's happening here is you have a pressure, profile, pressure gradient that's generating a pressure room flow that gets convoluted with the free charge density in the channel. And that tells you how much current you generate uh, in response to uh, pressure gradient. And then finally, there is the electrical conductivity term, uh, which is basically Ohm's law. And it has uh, several components. So the first is the ionic or ohmic uh, contribution, where you have the cation moving to the cathode and the anion moving to the anode. Um, but also, since you have a surface, and the surface has a charge that can perturb, uh, perturb the system, and so you have a positive charge bound in the wall, a negative charge on the surface uh, because of that, and that will give you additional source of conductivity. Um, and furthermore, this will also generate an electrosmotic flow profile, and this electrosmotic pro flow profile will also push the charges contributing to the conductivity. And so the state of the present work um, for porous and charged layers are limited in applicability and a bit difficult to implement. So exact and approximate expressions have been derived, but really only the low potential limit. And so that's below the thermal voltage, which is about 25 millivolts at room temperature. Uh, there have been few cases where the potential here is allowed to be large, and it's typically numeric because you have to solve a nonlinear equation. Um, and, and because of this, there's, there's no great framework in which to interpret data that you generated, electrokinetic data that you generated in these types of systems. And so we'd like to address these deficiencies um, in all the, electro, all the EKCM terms. So the system that we will be considering um, will allow the fluid permeable layers to be on infinite parallel plates. And so the separation here is much smaller than the extents uh, W and L. And there will really be two effects from the interface. Uh, the first is an electrical effect, which is because of this, the discontinuity and fixed charge when you go from fixed charge layer here to the bulk. And also, um, is an effect of the momentum distribution because you have different resistance in the porous layer than in, in the bulk fluid. So if we first look at the uh, electrical effect, you're basically solving the Poisson-Boltzmann equation outside of the pure fluid, and then a Poisson-Boltzmann equation with a fixed charge density on the inside. And so you have an additional fixed charge term because of the bound charge on these polymers. And there is an interesting limit uh, when you have when the gradient here or the the concavity here just appears when you have a balance between the free and the fixed charge in the film. And from that, you're able to extract the potential, which is the Donner potential. And the interesting thing here is you notice the Donner potential scales with the arc cinch of uh, 1 over the ionic strength. And so when you add more salt, you see a lower potential for a fixed charge. So the, the charge is not a function of whatever salt you're adding. So also, there's a, there's a flow effect. So we're solving the Stokes equation outside and the Brinkman equation inside. And the Brinkman equation is basically the Stokes equation with this extra term right here, which is due to the presence of the polymer. And so it's, it's adding resistance. This is basically like a, a Darcy term, a Darcy velocity. And so with this geometry, uh, we have a 1D set of equations. So uh, in the physical space, the plates are separated by this half distance h. Um, there are, in the porous layer here, the flow is governed by the resistance k the thickness delta, the viscosity eta. The potential is governed by the Debye length uh, and this thickness delta. Um, but if we can choose to mention this quantities and, and make this a little bit simpler, and so uh, we can dimension, pretty much make everything dimensionless by, um, by delta here, the film thickness becomes 1. This, this is h over delta or beta. And then the flow and potential are described by these parameters alpha and gamma. And so I'm, I'm going to explain what alpha, beta, and gamma are in subsequent slides. Uh, but also, we're going to make the charge dimensionless um, by 2 times the Faraday constant and the ionic strength. And then uh, you can make potential dimensionless uh, by the thermal voltage. And so there are really three parameters that govern the system. Uh, the first is alpha, which is the layer thickness over the fluid penetration depth. And you can visualize that here. And so you can imagine that when this thickness or this length becomes very small compared to delta, you don't have a lot of flow in the layer. So when alpha becomes large, it's very resistive. When it's small, it's fairly compliant. Also, there's this parameter beta, which is the cell half height over the layer thickness. And so when this is equal to 1, you have fully porous flow. And then when this is much larger than 1, uh, delta is very small compared to H, and there's a very thin uh, porous layer. Uh, finally, there's this parameter gamma, which is the b length over the layer thickness. And so uh, when this is much larger than 1, you have a, the double layer uh, really is not perturbed by the layer thickness. However, when it's very small, and delta is on the same order as lambda d, uh, excuse me, when this is 
But when lambda d is uh, large as compared to delta, then the, the double layer is perturbed by the layer. However, when it's very small, then it is not. And you can see that here, where if you look at the potential profile at the film edge, as lambda d becomes smaller, you, you get a much sharper profile um, at the film edge. And so the, the potential is able to develop within the film and not really be perturbed by the film edge. And so uh, using the equations that I presented in the non-dimensionalization that we've chosen, we can develop exact integral expressions for chi12 and chi22, and then apply these approximations, uh, and then apply approximations and validate them numerically. And so I'm presenting the two equations here. So chi22 again, this is the conductivity term which relates to Ohm's law, right? So, uh, but again, we're finding uh, we're relating the flux of current to the applied uh, electrical potential gradient. Um, and so there's one term which accounts for the electroosmotic conduction, and then another term which accounts for the ohmic conduction. Uh, if we look at the next term, which is the chi21, and again, this is equivalent to chi12 through Anzaga reciprocity, but it's also something that we have shown, um, just, or I have shown just by doing the math out, which was actually kind of laborious. Um, and so here we're relating the current that's driven by a pressure difference, the pressure difference. So that's shown schematically here. There's a pressure that generates this flow profile, and then it's going to get convoluted uh, with this free charge density that exists in the film in the bulk. And so if we look at the source of all these terms, there's one term that's contributed from the boundary, which will get swamped, uh, which will go basically go to zero when the film is very resistive, because it's going to kind of get killed by this uh, Koch term here, and also by the tanch over, uh, over alpha, since alpha is the resistance in the film. There's, a, there's an overlap correction, so uh, when the potential profiles do overlap, you see you will observe a decrease in the observed streaming current. And finally, there's a contribution from the porous layer. Um, so since you're pushing all of the charge here, that will, that will generate flux. And then uh, this term H relates uh, to the flow profile everywhere within the film, and we term this the filter function, since you get a, a non-uniform attenuation of flux, since your flow here at the boundary will tend to be larger than deep within the film, since the film is resistive. And so you will sample this charge uh, non-uniformly because of this function. And so our approximations reduce those integral equations to forms that are relatively simple and that you, you can use uh, in practice. And so this is uh, the connectivity term. This is the streaming potential term. And this is the connectivity term. And so these are approximate. And we do validate the assumptions that we've made to generate these equations uh, with a numerical solution of the full expression I did on the previous page. And we do observe excellent agreement um, for a wide range of the parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma, and also the potentials. And so I'm going to show uh, these results here. And so in particular, uh, this is chi t1. This is, I'm plotting here both the numer numerical and analytical, and you can't see the difference um, because the, the agreement is very close. Um, however, if we look at something that's percent difference, or excuse me, in the, in the low resistance region, we have a very high flux, and so that explains why the numbers are so large here. However, when you get to a high resistance region, again, alpha is telling you how resistive the film is, then you will see a very low flux, right? So the charge profile uh, gets perturbed because it's perturbed from um, the Poisson-type flow profile um, because of the fixed charge. And the resistance is generated by uh, the polymer in the film. So if you look at the percent error, we see that we have excellent agreement uh, when the resistance is low. However, as the resistance becomes higher, the agreement is not as good, although um, errors are about uh, 10%. And we can explain um, these errors based on uh, what we know about the film. So again, when we have a large flow in a region that matches the assumption, we have a low error. We have a slightly moderate error when the, we look at uh, primarily flow in this transition region where our assumption um, Kind of, kind of breaks down. And so that in that case, we get just a moderate error. Um, and then the, since, the, again, we have a sharpening of the potential profile, uh, and so when you go from something like gamma is 1 over 5 to 1 over 100, when you, you travel along this direction, you're getting closer to, to our assumed distribution of uh, potential and charge. And so our error is decreasing. And also, our approximate expressions for chi 2 to uh, match numerical computations. And again, we, we see very small errors over the entire range. So the points, uh, or the symbols are the numerics and the lines <coughs> for the theory. Again, you have, uh, you have really great uh, matching here. And so there is a previous theory, uh, and it's by Dukin et al. 
and it applies only in the region of uh, high film resistance. And so we've extended uh, predictive capability into this uh, low resistance region. Um, and I'd like to kind of demonstrate, again, by comparison of errors. So this is our error here. We get, at worst case, 1.2%. Uh, and, it, and this is Dukin's error. And so Dukin gets errors of uh, about 100% at 10 to the 0, where we're at about 0.1. Um, and so this is the error that the maximum error that I get is bound by this box. And again, looking here at a log scale as compared to my linear scale. And so with this framework, uh, we've created a, a way to uh, interpret electrokinetic effects in porous and charged layers. So we've, again, developed expressions for each term in the electrokinetic coupling matrix. And this enables predictions of all the outputs, so string, potential vis electric viscosity, anything you like to model. Um, we're able to validate our predictions with numerical simulation of the coupling terms. And we've uh, presented this work, or are about to present this work, uh, as indicated here. All right, so in the final part of the talk, I'd like to describe uh, the recent work studying the electric kinetics of Napion thin films, in particular, conductivity and streaming potential measurements. So we perform electric kinetic experiments on Napion. Uh, mostly because it has some interesting and unique chemical properties. So the natheon is basically Teflon that has a strong negative charge, and so it has these sulfonate groups that are very acidic. Um, it's used in fuel cells. Uh, you can put it on something like a sensor or an electrode uh, as a coating. Again, it's extremely acidic, so the pKa is about minus 6, and this has been estimated. Uh, it's, we assume that it will be independent of charging. And so it has a morphology, as uh, shown in this picture. What do you mean independent of charging? Uh, sorry, independent of um, plate. It's not pH dependent. So you can, you can put it in, in any kind of acid. We expect it to be deprotonated. Or exhibit the same charge. Since we'll always be away from the, since the pH will be far away from the pKa. Yeah, you're not going to get anything with the pKa like that yet, but if you put it on the yeah. Yeah. Um, And so the, the morphology is as seen here, where you have uh, a phase that's primarily Teflon and a phase that's primarily aqueous. And then the boundary between two phases uh, is basically the sulfonate group. And so you have these very, you have these channels that are on the order of one or two, one to three nanometers, um, and they're basically lined um, by these negative charges from the sulfonate group. And so in the present work, we're going to study this material in a way that's not really been seen uh, in the literature before. So uh, to do with these experiments, we perform a variety of measurements uh, on our substrate. So there's film preparation involved, which we characterize with XPS, and also ellipsometry and profilometry. And then we're going to perform uh, conductance measurements and stream potential measurements and interpret all of these um, using the formalism that I described on our earlier slides. So uh, to prepare these films, we cast about 300 nanometers of, of natheon from a polymer dispersion. So we start with clean glass slides uh, with an epoxy terminated silane. Um, since we can get natheon as a dispersion in water and alcohol, we just dilute it a little bit uh, to about three, 3 weight percent, and then spin on the substrate, bake it for an hour at 150 C, and then wash it in, uh, in nitric acid. And so the way that we analyze these samples is in a, or analyze them electrokinetically, is in a, a home built uh, four electrode parallel plate electrokinetic cell. So that's showing uh, here, and also a schematic at right. And so the the parallel plates with the natheon will sit uh, right here. We have two electrodes for current sourcing, two electrodes in the back for uh, voltage sensing. We have a pump that drops a flow in. We measure pressure, and then we can collect the fluid in the outlet. So again, this is a system level diagram uh, where you see that all of, basically all of the components uh, feed into a DAC or are otherwise controlled um, by a script that we write in LabVIEW. And this is a sample of the data that you get. And so we source a flow cyclically that generates a cyclic pressure and also a cyclic voltage. And then we can apply a Fourier transform to this beta and pluck out the amplitude <coughs> at the driving frequency. So we can uh, use that data in our formalism that eliminates a, a large amount of noise or any kind of drift that we see in our system. So our results indicate that um, Chi 2 one is relatively insensitive to pH, but it depends strongly on the ionic strength of the solution. So you can see that here, where we test the films at pHs 3, 4, and 5 over a range of ionic strength. And you can see that in this space, this, this trend is, it, is mostly linear, but again, we're in a long scale. And then also we can interpret this in, tor in terms of a phenomenological zeta potential, which doesn't really make sense for a porous and charged layer, but it is kind of instructive to see what these values are if you're, if you're used to interpreting um, electrokinetic data. 
How did you vary the pH? Uh, we just have different solutions. So I run different solutions for what? Oh, it's HCl. So it's not really buffered? No, it's not buffered. So I have uh, computed any kind of, or the amount of dissolved CO2 that I get. And at pH 5, it's still like 1% of the contributing charge. Also, point, I mean, so. at the very low ionic strength, then that does your pH controlling species going to affect your ionic strength? You think oh, it absolutely does. Yeah, so that's, that's, that is computed. That's uh, accounted for. And so you do see this in the conductivity data as well. Yeah. Um, sorry, to, to, do, you, do you ever have any problems with the buffering capacity? Do you, uh, can you like, compare it with inlet and outlet solutions or solutions after you start the experiment or after you end the experiment? Do you detect any like, differences in pH? Um, so I, I don't. And I do measure the pH before and after. And I also measure the conductivity before and after. And I don't see very large differences. Um, so I guess the, a lot of the reasons we don't want to use a buffer is we like to know exactly. I guess you want to keep the electrolytes simple. So we, we yeah, don't. But I mean, at those pHs, I said they, it's a relatively simple line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the other advantage with with these ions compared to the natheon um, is also to do with the pore size. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, acetate is still small. Um, and over that pH range, you could start to use acetate. And you wouldn't have to use very much because you probably don't need much capacity, but having it buffered so yeah. much better. <laughs> yeah, I, guess I, I suppose. Uh, but again, like I did compute the, the, the numbers, and it didn't, didn't seem large at all compared to what else was in solution. So that's just that pH 5. If pH is 3 and 4, it's. Yeah, pH 6 should not be a problem. Okay. pH 5 might be. Yeah, on the like there, it, it almost starts to get close. I would, I would say that. Yeah, I would say. I mean, I can, I can show you that. And so this behavior is consistent with the Dunn and scaling, um, like I described before, where it goes as the arc sinh of 1 over the ionic string. Um, and so we think it's consistent, uh, or it is, it is consistent with the Dunn and scaling. And so for this data, we can apply our theory to extract the charge density and the penetration length, which are the only unknown parameters for us in the system. And so uh, here's our model. Uh, and so again, charge density and penetration length are the only fitted parameters. So we predict a charge density of uh, 0.0582 moles per liter, which is underpredicted. And so this is what we predict versus what DuPont says uh, the charge density is. And we also predict a penetration length of about one and a half nanometers. So this is on similar order to the pore size. So this is not the only set of measurements that we have. Uh, we also have conductivity uh, measurements. It's shown, showing that here. And so the way that we perform these measurements is uh, measure the voltage for a specific applied current. And so the electrodes supplying the current are different than the electrodes measuring uh, the voltage. And so we try to, to get rid of any polarization effects that way. And so uh, what we're seeing here are the models at pHs 3, 4, and 5, along with the data uh, shown with error bars. And we get a decent match. Uh, and this model is consistent with the charge density that's the accepted value, although the penetration length um, is much, much smaller. And I'm comparing. Um, these but I mean, if you're in those error bars, you could draw a horizontal line and hit almost all of them. Uh, almost. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the, the lines, I mean, there's not a severe amount of concavity uh, to these lines. But in comparison to what other workers have seen, um, our conductivity measurements do seem to be within the ballpark, and there is a rather large spread. So uh, presenting, there's a lot of uh, data here in particular. The open and wire symbols are an atheon in the presence of not just proton, but proton and some other cation. And then the filled symbols are just proton. And so um, you know, this goes all the way from about 17 down to, I think, the Yeo is like 0.08 or something like that. Um, and so there's an enormous spread even as you go over ionic strength and even if you have something that's just uh, DI water. Um, and so, like, again, our data is in this, mostly in this region here. Um, and then something else that's interesting is there also tends to be a thickness dependence of these results. And so if we look at the thickness in microns, so our films are extremely thin. So these are, again, like 300 nanometers. Um, but you do see a slight dependence 
when you go from films that are fairly thick to films that are thin, the thicker films tend to exhibit a larger membrane conductivity. And this has been something that's uh, discussed in the literature. Do, do, do you mind going, going back to the previous slide? So can you help me understand the, the physics behind the fact that this goes down then up? So you, this is you, what you're describing is the excess conductivity that comes from the Napion film. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So why, what are the mechanisms that make that change as a function of ion stuff? So we basically have uh, three inputs in the model. Mm -hmm. um, so the first will be the, the bulk ohmic conductivity, which is just from whatever solution you put into, uh, you put into the cell. The second is an excess ohmic conductivity. Mm -hmm. And that's because you have charge groups that will pull ions towards them. And the third is the electroosmotic conductivity, which is, again, do the same sources as the excess ohmic. Mm -hmm. um, and so the electroosmotic conductivity is basically constant, mm -hmm. because that's driven by the fixed charge density. The fixed charge density doesn't change. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a slight difference, because you are changing the Debye length as you add more salt. Mm -hmm. So those numbers do change not a whole lot. So mostly this uptick comes from the fact that as you increase the ionic strength, you add more ions in the solution, and that's what it goes on. So there's more ions in the double layer that are being carried by the electrosmosis. So it's, it, no, it's actually the ohmic term, according to the model. In any of the things that do you plot versus one of those core <coughs> ionic strength, because that basically accounts for the ionic strength? Uh, I do not. That might not be a bad thing just to try. Can you, can you help me understand? Um, what goes into these? Are these the raw data that you take, or is this? These are not the raw data. So well, this, how, how, are these, how are these related to the raw data? That's so um, we never measure a conductivity. We only ever measure a conductance. So we measure a current or a voltage. Uh -huh. And we know the geometry of the cell. And then you can extract a conductivity from that. Because the conductivity is an intrinsic measurement. And so we basically I write out a model uh -huh. for uh, an equivalent circuit model of the cell. So an yeah. has yeah. some yeah. conductivity, and the has some conductivity. Uh -huh. And then you basically do the math on that, and then the total conductivity. And from that, you can extract a Nathion conductivity, which depends on the difference in heights between the bulk layer and the film. So th this is basically a measurement of the, uh, of the difference between what you measure and what you would have predicted from the bulk? Um, yes. It's not exactly that, because there's this geometric factor that comes in, because it's a, a conductivity. OK, fair enough. Yeah, sure. But it's, it's almost that. Okay. And then you can, um, and what is bulk? So the, the bulk is uh, if you have the fluid in a beaker and you stick a conductivity probe in it, then you read up the number on the left, on, the, on a bench. That's just without the surface, no without surface. surface effects. Sorry. So do you mind going to the next slide now? So what's up with all the, the, the thickness dependence? Yeah. What, What's the current understanding of that? So what's been proposed um, is when, when you're measuring that, that the surface has different properties than the bulk. And so when you get thin, the surface layer is accentuated as compared to the thickness of the entire material. So in that case, you, you get a lower conductivity. And that, that seems to be consistent with Slade's data set. Yeah. So, so that's the hypothesis that, I mean, Slade is first place where I read about uh, this difference. But it's also seen, so Berbruga had older data mm -hmm. um, where he saw, or they saw the same thing. And then, so the Okada data doesn't have it really at all. So he, he tested two different membranes, and he saw the same, or they saw the same, basically the same conductivity. So they didn't observe the difference. But their cell was a little different than oh, this the, one the slate. The yeah, so it had some like over overlapping. Then what, what, is, what is the thing that what is the source of all the scatter in the data? This is the function of so since the membrane types since, no, since these are the open symbols, so what he's varying here is the the concentrations of proton and then like sodium or potassium or lithium. I see. And so then you see a connectivity. I see. Okay. And your films again were two hundred nanometers? Three hundred. About three hundred. Um, and so 
with these results and these observations from the literature, we can try to rectify our data with the explanation for what we're actually measuring. Um, and so when we have a pressure-driven flow, we're really pushing ions near the interface. Since we have a resistive film, we have very little convection uh, or advection deep within the film. And so we're probing this region here. However, when we have a conductivity, so this is a localized property measurement. However, when you measure the conductivity, uh, we're averaging over everywhere in the porous layer. Um, and so that tends to be more of a bulk measurement than the chi 1, 2, which is more localized to the surface because the film is resistive. And so uh, this, these results, uh, along with what the measurements probe, coupled with um, what's been positive to happen in the Atheon on the surface and in the vault. And this is, again, not, not just streaming potential data, but also um, when pe people have done AFM on the film and you see that uh, when it's hydrated and when it's dry, the surface uh, behaves differently. So you have self groups that will go out um, when the film becomes wet. And that's different than what you would expect to happen um, in the vault. And so uh, the surface is different than the vault uh, for an Atheon film. So we have a region of moderate resistance and low charge density that we probe, and also a region of high resistance and higher charge density um, in the bulk. And this is consistent with our measurement and also consistent with the literature, although to conclude this, you need to look at it more in detail. So can I, can I ask a question about, yeah. about this? So then going, going forward, how would one would one probe this? Like what, so you're, you're arguing that the measurements you're making in different ways are measuring a region that's close to the surface defined largely by lambda d, I think. And then the other one is, is probing uh, everything defined by delta. Yeah, so I would say that the first one is not probed by lambda d, but is probed more by lambda than not. So that's the fluid penetration depth. Fair enough. So, so then you, you have up there the difference of resistance, which would suggested in homogeneity of the film, which would be a different question than lambda not, which is just a yes. screening length that could occur if it was a homogeneous. Mm -hmm. Right. That, yeah, that's also, that's also true. And so are you supposing that, so do you mean one or the other or both? <laughs> uh, so so in the, for, for the formalism that I have now is I just have lambda not changing because I don't suppose that the film can have uh, the varying resistance. That might be the case. Uh, I think that's harder to test. And so the reason I've ch avoided adding in, I mean, I guess I could explain it with more parameters, but I'm trying to resist doing that because I, I don't I can't test that necessarily. Um, but that's certainly certainly possible. I think that there might be another difference between the conductivity and the streaming potential. Mm -hmm. um, if you do conductivity, you're applying an electric field mm -hmm. to the charges on the surface, and you're applying an opposite electric field to the charges in the core. And so you drive a relative motion of the two. And that can give rise to a different drag force on the surface, mm -hmm. which would be a different Brickman parameter. Okay. I haven't thought about which that. is something that I, I actually should have thought of it earlier and told you, and I just realized as you were presenting oh. it, it. It's something that people have worried about sometimes in polyelectrolytes for the the electrophoresis of DNA, for example, is uh, if you had a if you had a neutral polymer that was diffusing through a fluid, then its drag depends on a sort of uh, uh, radius of gyration of the polymer. Mm -hmm. But if you have a DNA, even if it is uh, coiled, its drag depends on the length. And it depends on the length because each whip, each point along the polymer backbone, there's a, a sort of little double layer mm -hmm. uh, if it's at high enough ionic strength. Okay. And so in that case, it can lead to pretty significant difference of drag because radius of gyration is at the right to 0.6, and the uh, length is molecular weight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't thought about this opposite shearing. 
something here that I'm not understanding. When you say region of moderate resistance and low charge density, region of high resistance and high charge density, I would associate high charge density with better conductivity and lower resistance rather than the optimum. Uh, so the reason that I'm, I'm proposing this is um, so well, first, first you verify. When you say resistance, do you mean hydraulic resistance, or do you mean electrical, electrical resistance? Maybe that solves the whole problem. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm saying moderate resistance as in moderate resistance to flow. Here okay. is here is much more resistance to flow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're good. So, okay. so I, <laughs> so I, uh, I mean, what I'm interested in is you. Um, so you've identified that uh, your measurements are consistent with a mechanistic hypothesis that you're proving. Two regions with the scale separation, one's really close to the surface, parameterized by lambda naught. Uh, one is doing the whole thing parameterized by phi delta. <clears throat> Which means that if you really want, if you if you want to take the next step, right, the next step would be to go in this and zoom in and measure everything. Right? So in, in the thought experiment, you like to take an image of everything and see how everything looks, and you like to probe the hydraulic and electrokinetic responses of every aspect of this film with, with resolution. Uh, so I don't presume that that's easy, but what what might the knobs be that you would turn to try to control that? If you were to start a new experiment, say, okay, now I'm going to map this out with 10 nanometer resolution or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's a little tricky to do um, because you can imagine trying to, to tune something like lambda naught, um, but you can't change the viscosity independently of uh, how, how the new fluid will affect the Nathion film. Mm -hmm. um, but what, I guess one thing that you might want to do if you think you have a surface effect is to change the the size of the surface relative to the bulk. So you can do thicker or thinner films mm -hmm. and see if that changes the result. Um, there's also a question, if I have very high resistance or high mechanical resistance deep within the film, then I maybe just hydrate my film better. So you saw that I'm baking at 150C, right, which is, is really hot. Um, but it is something that people do to these films. Um, and so we could try a different procedure to hydrate it after we bake it or bake it at a different temperature. Uh -huh. um, we could... Are you sure you don't degrade the polymer at 150? That's awfully close to that. Um, so we do XPS and... Yeah, well, XPS so thin. Yeah, so it will still be there. Um, Whether you cook it. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't have a measurement after 150C, although people have uh, used that temperature for these films. I mean, it is above... Uh, I mean, it's, it's chosen because it's hot enough that the, the polymer will rearrange. Right, so you're above. Right, and in principle, cook too. Yeah, I mean, possi possibly it will cook. Um, Along the lines of these questions would be if, if the proposal was to change the film thickness, how much confidence can you have that you're not changing the, the nature of the film <laughs> due to the preparation procedure? Um, well, I mean, I think that's that's almost the goal of, for me, I think it's almost the goal of changing, changing the thickness. So if we're in a regime um, that's changed the nature of the film, I think it's important to know. And, and so if there's a difference between sort of changing the film because of thickness and changing the film because the chemistry is different. Yes. Uh, well, if we find out that the chemistry is different, I think that's really important to know. Uh, because the then, difference between the batter and the cake. Yeah. <laughs> All this stuff is better, but talking in different form. Yeah. Uh, it's, it is true that you do see different morphologies. Um, they should get really, really thin. So people have oh, yeah. done uh, different spectroscopies on this interface, and that you do see. They will say the exposure of the sulfonic groups is very yeah. stronger than on. You can see uh, lamella forming near the interface, depending on the substrate material. So if it's glass, you see the lamella. If it's if it's gold or platinum, then you then you don't. Um, and so. If we're in some regime where the, the shape is not, you know, the, the poor ball, poor ball uh, model of the account, then it's important for us to know. You, you've been talking about linear responses. Yes. I wonder, of course, that makes life simpler. <laughs> but I wonder if, given that you're saying that one response you think is probing the surface and the other the bulk more, if you want to nonlinear response, no. Is it possible that you would get a coupling in some so something that would allow you to distinguish different mechanisms so that you were getting a response that depends both on the pressure gradient and the electric field? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I guess when I when I normally talk about something that's linear or nonlinear, I mean when you apply a potential, the potential doesn't change the interfacial charge. Um, however, well, like for for example, uh, um, if I apply a voltage across, as you're applying the voltage to the membrane, there shouldn't be any chance for concentration polarization, right. right? But if you apply it across the membrane, yes, that sounds like the uh, experiment that will create a concentration polarization. Yes, does that does that change the way you we answer with the the, the data, the literature, does it make you argue that yours is better or worse, or that there are other options? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, I like the I like the way this experiment is set up uh, yeah. because I have a plane, mm -hmm. right, and so a plane is easy to to model and analyze. Um, I don't have this concentration error, but the possibility of concentration polarization because I'm not, you know, forcing fluid uh, or forcing ions into a core that will generate that that instability. Mm -hmm. um, so, for, from the answers here, do I take it that you've never come anywhere near to detecting nonlinear response? No, I don't think I've seen nothing that's not. I was saying the electrokinetic effects. I think could give a nonlinear response. Did you look for another yeah. linear response? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not I sure. Forget what the numbers of it. Is this the Hartman number or something? Um, no, I mean, <laughs> no, I'll, that's the right one. I'm not sure how I would generate when something. When you polarize local double A Yeah, I don't, I mean, like, the fields that I'm observing are really small. Um, typically, when people see these, you do something on linear is because you have a very high field, but the numbers that I get are pretty small. Yeah, you just may not be in yeah. the field. So, so I mean, I, they're so small that I have a hard time measuring them. Um, so like, I'm presenting the data at, you know. I'm being influenced from having interacted with in the nurture's group on uh, separation of DNA mm -hmm. electric rhesus, and I think they use quite large fields. Yeah. Now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, one, one thing you might be able to look at, what's the uh, field in volts per centimeter that you measure? Right, so for a, a pulsed field electrophoresis, it might be 1,000 volts per centimeter or something like that. Yeah. Where uh, are you at? So I measure maybe a, a millivolt over 50 centimeters. 50 millimeters. Uh, yes, 50 millimeters. Sorry. I do. Um, it, you might go back to the slide toward the end where you have the picture of the yeah anything anything here. <laughs> there we go. Um, what, uh, what you have a, a fluid right in here. So your fluid is water, and I don't know why you use water as relevant to it. But you can you can you can tweak with water, right? You can make its uh, viscosity go down if you mix it with the season nitrile. You can make its permittivity go down if you mix it with the season nitrile. You can make its uh, viscosity be not monotonic if you mix it with ethanol. You could put in a uh, uh, zwitterionic material to make the permittivity go up, right? So you can you can tweak the permittivity from say 50 to 250, and you can make the viscosity go you know up by a factor of 10 or 100, or maybe down by 30 percent. Um, is that a useful knob here? What, you know, what would be the effect on what you might expect from say exposure of sulfonate groups if you change the permittivity? Or what might be the difference in the spatial variation of these phenomena if you change epsilon? Sure. So I mean, if you change the permittivity, it's not going to change everything. So if you have a very simple model of the conductivity, it really shouldn't change with permittivity. It will change the electroosmotic term. Right. I mean, it'll change the mobilities of all the ions mm -hmm. uh, and in a way that's probably consistent with the way it's changed the So I guess the in my, in my mind, I'm trying to, to make, I want to make lambda d change in scale or lambda not change. I want to make something change in scale so that you can like map it out of space. And I just, is permittivity a useful knob? I guess I haven't figured out how permittivity is a useful knob, but do you, see, do you see potential in that path or not? Uh, I think it, it could be interesting um, to add bitter ion. I mean, it can be interesting for different reasons. Uh, maybe your bitter ion is not going to go into the Nathion. 
And so you can generate a system where you have the permittivity gradient in and outside of the film. And I think that could be interesting. I don't know. Um, I don't know what's known about like exclusion of fluid ions from. Yes, I'm, I'm not. People generally, or at least I haven't seen. I, mean, I haven't really looked for uh, uh -huh. this literature. And also, it's tricky because it also depends on the interaction. There's beta ion with the fixed charges here, and that can change the whole. So half wants to go in, the other half doesn't. With regards to viscosity, people have used sugar as simple as that to change the viscosity of water in Nathion. Those studies already have been done. Yeah, it was yeah, a lot question. many years ago. Yeah, like whether cosmotropes and chaotropes could affect this. Your uh, <laughs> sugar is cosmotropic, I think. Right? Because people sugar is cosmotropic. I have no idea what that is. Oh, uh, <laughs> the, 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 yeah. So, like, especially around the protein folding curvature, when people want to make proteins fold in a specific way, oh. uh, sugar is very helpful in that. The most protein refolding protocols have a bunch of sugar. So, I mean, even without seeing the effects of the Zwitter ions, you do see changes with simple cations. So, if you put a lithium. Oh, okay, sure, because so that's just also very different. Yes, and, and so I think that that's really what drives a lot of the conductivity is, is how much water you have in your I mean, in that context, in this picture, you might want to draw the cations much smaller and the anions much bigger. Yes. yes. As a chemist, that sort of bothers me. Reverse it, because the electron density, I mean, the sulfonates are going to be these big mother guys, and therefore they should be a lot smaller. OK. Um, so we've coupled uh, theory and experiment in these charge layers. So we developed expressions for, for all the coefficients, although I didn't discuss at all the, the hydraulic conductivity. Um, so we developed exact integral forms and then approxim made approximations from these exact integral forms and then benchmarked that approximations with numerical simulations. We performed electrokinetic measurements in Nathion films. This is somewhat of a unique cell for these materials. Uh, a new range of ionic strength. And also, we have very, very thin films as compared to what's in the literature. And finally, we interpreted these parameters, uh, interpreted uh, these measurements um, in terms of how they uh, interact with the Nathion film. And so we saw that it was consistent with varying with the variant film properties. Um, and this is uh, also seen in the literature via a variety of uh, experiments. And so, um, in summary, I've contributed to a lot of different uh, to areas uh, in this work. And so. Uh, again, most of it was on the electrokinetics here with the uh, publications that publications that I've indicated. Then also um, the work that we did uh, previously with the Banker Lab studying right hippocampal neurons. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, contributions from a lot of people. Uh, first off, the thesis committee, so, so thank you for serving. Um, and also uh, group members, funding sources, and the facilities that I utilize to perform this research. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. Talk is open for questions. I have one. I, you probably discussed this, but I, I just didn't quite understand it. I remember you plotted uh, conductivity versus ionic strength, and I understand why it goes up at the high end of ionic strength because you have more ions. But why does it go up at the low end of ionic strength? So at the low end, then you have a high potential. Since the potential scales with arc sinh of 1 over the ionic strength, you'll have a high potential. High zeta potential, you mean? Uh, it's potential. not really a zeta potential, but yeah, it is. It's like so effect of zeta potential. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you be worried about the uh, con uh, concentration of the fixed charges within the polymer changing as with the pre uh, pressure gradient? Uh, no. So I can't think of what's the mechanism that you would think of for that. So the pressure is higher on one side and lower on the other side, so the polymer is more compressed on one side. I see. Uh, no. Uh, roughly, what up, what would be like the bulk modulus of the polymer? Uh, I don't know. Pressure gradient is small. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's, what's the magnitude of the pressure difference? Uh, 0.6 psi. Yeah. 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 The atmosphere is so, so microscopic, so locally, you know. It would be very difficult. 0.6 over um, about 50 
How rough is the glass that you're using? And how does that roughness compare to the thickness of the film? Um, and would that affect the would that affect the measurements? Like having like a convoluted surface coated in Napier, which, it, which it, may have variable. It certainly would. I mean, people have proposed roughness. Uh, so Todd Spires wrote a paper about uh, roughness and electrosmotic flows, and you can suppress electrosmotic flows with roughness. Yeah. Um, but you need to have roughness that's on the similar order to the other like the electrokinetic length discussed, mm -hmm. which is mostly like the divide length, mm -hmm. and that's not the case here. Um, I mean, I haven't characterized the roughness on the glass, um, but the film is, you can see the film on the glass, and I don't, s yeah, I mean, I haven't characterized it, so I can't say exactly, but I don't expect that the roughness of the glass is on the order. Well, what, um, can you infer that from the interference tensions? Um, I'm not sure how I would do that. I mean, you do see interference fringes when you, Slam the glass together. But you don't see interference switches when when you just look at the bulb one. Uh, so if it's uh, if I take two glass slides and have the bulb film and I slam them together, I don't believe I see. I don't see interference from this. I'm thinking of, a, of an isolated film. I see you have a no. 300 yeah, centimeters right here. It's Lambda over 2 for the small way. Okay. I don't see interference from this. Would the suppression of electroosmotic flow by roughness be a way of thinking about what's happening at the top of the nanometer by you? would say that your apparent charge density is low? Um, it, it could be, um, because I don't, I don't know the exact morphology of the nephon if it has some uh, some roughness that's on that same, I mean, I guess it could be on the same length scale, um, but it's also flow through and not just bound to being flow over. What is the divide thickness range? Uh, so, we're going probably between ten and point one meters. Mm -hmm. So it crosses through the four thickness mm -hmm. scenario. I would have guessed that the roughness might be comparable with four thickness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, could, I think I could find that. And although, as you say, there is flow through to the extent that it might, in default, not be very permeable, mm -hmm. and there might not be very much flow through when you're not forcing it with the fire flying the field. Yeah, I mean, there, yeah, I mean, it's, I think, you, I mean, you also do need kind of high potentials to see the suppression. I mean, you need a higher surface potential to see the suppression. Um, uh, so I mean, I think I looked at I looked at uh, doing a roughness experiment briefly with a different material. And I think I needed six or eight times the thermal voltage, which would be applicable for us in maybe low ion strength solutions, but it wouldn't be applicable at the high range. And our trend is. It does have a nice scaling to it. So if it does happen, then maybe it is small. So I guess if we saw the effect, then would have, uh, like it would follow the theory and then dip, dip off. So maybe, maybe you could argue that that's what's happening here. But I guess I would only expect it at the, the high end of ionic strength where you have, well, there's two, two competing effects. Is the divide length is different, but you also have the higher potential. The small divide thickness. Sorry, large divide, thick, large divide length, and uh, all right. I think this concludes the open portion of the exam. So now we'll ask everyone to take off, and then we'll. Uh,